Hello everyone and welcome to the Daily News Simplified, your one-stop solution to detailed analysis of current affairs which are published in the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper and are equally relevant for your UPSC preparation. Articles dated 21st of November 2022 are listed on your screen and the time stamping along with the notes in PDF and Word format are given in the description box. So let us begin with the first article for the day. The lead article for today's discussion was published on page 12 of the Hindu newspaper. This article actually goes against the report which was published in the Hindu newspaper on Saturday, that is yesterday, with respect to the performance of Pradhan Mantri Kisan Samman Nidhi or PM Kisan. So, the report was actually based on an RTI which was filed to the Ministry of Agriculture and against this Ministry of Agriculture has responded that the report is partially true. The report which was based on the RTI says that only 3.87 crore farmers have received all 11 EMIs under the Prime Minister Kisan Yojana and the 11th EMI receivers that is the latest EMI have fell by 67% which is a sign of grave concern. Now, if we go by the UPSC trend, as you can see, these are some of the previous year question, right from 2016, 18 and even 2021. In GS paper 3, in the mains examination, in economic section questions, UPSC have been asking scheme related questions. So as you can see, they have asked on Pradhan Mantri Jandhan Yojana, Smart Cities, Pradhan Mantri Fazal Bima Yojana, Minimum Support Price and even recently the National Food Security Act 2013. But to your notice, you'll find that they have asked different dimensions of this scheme. For example, its role in financial inclusion, their basic relevance in India's urban development, salient features of this scheme, which was again repeated in 2021, and the basic meaning of certain schemes. So given the same perspective, we are going to analyze what Pradhan Mantri Kisan Samman Nidhi is all about and what are the benefits and the limitations of this scheme on India's agriculture sector. So about the scheme says that it is a scheme where a sum of 6,000 rupees per year is transferred to the farmers in three different installments of 2,000 each. This scheme was launched in 2019 as a central sector scheme where the entire functioning and the funding comes from the Ministry of Agriculture under the central government. The identification on the other hand of the beneficiaries lies in the hand of states and the union territories. The reason being simple that agriculture is a state subject and all data recorded with respect to the land allocation and the land ownership lies with the respective states and the union territories and not the central government. As the scheme is based on the identification of farmers, hence the identification of beneficiaries of the scheme lies with the state. Now, the reason for the rolling out of the scheme was to provide a supplement financial need to the farmers, especially the small and marginal farmers. Small and marginal farmers are those who have land areas less than 2 hectares. The second objective was to protect them from falling into the clutches of money lenders. Now, India is a country where since independence, money lenders have been holding a majority of position in terms of lending to the Indian farmers as far as non-institutional investment is concerned. The basic reason behind the rise of money lender was that there was a lack of institutional credit available to the people. Farmers who were living in the rural areas, especially those rural areas which have no accessibility as far as banking structure is concerned, were more reliant on money lenders and were paying exorbitant interest rate and even the interest rate on the interest rate and they were under the clutches of these money lenders. To resolve this issue, government first of all launched the regional ruler banks. They supported the cooperative banks and also laid down the infrastructure of commercial banks or the scheduled commercial banks in the rural areas. However, still the ratio of money lenders in majority of the rural areas remain very high. So, in order to provide the cash transfer to the farmers, government has launched this scheme. As far as eligibility is concerned, so when the scheme was rolled out, it was limited to the small and the marginal farmers who were having land areas that to the cultivable land areas under 2 hectares. However, multiple cases were excluded. That is, if a person is having different areas under different families, 
For example, a single person holding different lands in different areas and combined area of that person will be more than two hectares will not be eligible for this. Any family which is holding up to 10 hectares but working on the pool basis. Let's say there are five brothers in the family and together they are having 10 hectares of land. So if they are pooling their land for the agriculture, yes, they will be eligible for this scheme. However, in June 2019, all farmers, not only the small and the marginal, but all farmers were included under this scheme. There are certain people who are excluded. The first one is the taxpayers. So in India, anyone who is earning more than 5 lakh rupees per annum is a taxpayer and that person is excluded from this scheme. Institutional landholders, let's say a person who is holding a land for commercial purpose, let's say warehousing, will be excluded from this scheme. Holders of constitutional or government post and certain professionals such as doctors, chartered accountants, lawyers and others will be excluded from this scheme. Now after going through all the important provision of the scheme, it is important to understand that this is not a direct benefit transfer scheme of subsidy. So the 6000 rupees received by farmer should not be taken as a subsidy on any particular thing. It is not a subsidy for farmers, it is not a subsidy on fertilizer or even on the fuel. It is just the direct money transfer from government to farmer and it is up to farmer whether he or she wants to spend it on the investment in agriculture or otherwise. Secondly, it is not a legal right given to the farmer. So no farmer can approach a court saying that he or she has not received 6000 rupees per year. Now based on the article, now this is something which was published on Sunday's newspaper and the same has been repeated even today and that is the reason why we have taken this article in much detail. Now as per the RTI which was filed in the Ministry of Agriculture, this is the following data. Now first installment that is in 2019 as you can see, almost these many people received funding in different state. And to your surprise, the poorer states such as Bihar or Madhya Pradesh have been receiving less than 100. But as we go into the detail analysis after three years, that is 11th installment, as you can see that in Madhya Pradesh, the percentage decline was very, very high. So 99.9% .9 decline was there. Let's say there were 1000 people who were receiving the fund. Now only 10 of them are receiving while 990 are not receiving the installment. The same is true with the other states such as Chhattisgarh, which is also a poor tribal state. Here also the decline is very high. And this is a matter of concern because if government is looking for replacing the minimum support price with that of the cash transfers, such kind of poor performance in the existing scheme is not a good sign. Now, if we go through the basic arguments given by the center and the state, we'll find that center has argued that there is no money sent to any fraud beneficiaries. So according to center, every money that they are releasing is reaching the right beneficiaries, first of all. And secondly, government has argued that whatever money they have sent is sent directly to the bank account. There is no intermediaries ever functioning under this scheme. And this account is based on the 100% error-free data which they have received from the state. So now center is saying that if there is any error, it is the error created by the states, not the center. On the other hand, the state government is saying that states are uploading the data after verification on their specific eligibility. Whether a person is a farmer or not, that is rectified by the states, data is collected and that goes to the verification. And after the verification, there is a second level of verification which is done by the center itself. This verification is based on the updation of the Aadhaar of a specific farmer by UIDAI. Then we have the PFMS, which is Public Financial Management System, which also undertakes the important data collection. There is Income Tax Department, which also look into the exclusion of the scheme. And then there is National Payment Corporation of India Limited. So all these organizations have rectified the data at second stage. Now the point is that center is blaming state and state is blaming center on the data collection. However, no one is looking into that how much fund actually has been dispersed by the respective parties and whether this fund has been utilized by the farmer for the agriculture purposes or not. And after the entire verification, 
स्टेट मेक अ रिक्वेस्ट ऑफ फंड टू द सेंटर नाउ इफ स्टेट हैज मेड अ रिक्वेस्ट लेट से ऑफ हंड्रेड करोड़ रुपीज टू द सेंटर एंड सेंटर हैज बीन सेंडिंग that same money to the farmer in their bank account then how come we say that there was a decline of 67% now as center has agreed on the same there is an issue with the scheme as well now from the perspective of upsc examination we are going to analyze the benefits and the limitation of this scheme in much more detail now this is something which is important for your gs3 mains examination such kind of arguments are desirable in the mains examination itself now let us start with the benefits first the first benefit of pm kisan is that it can work to bring farmers income out of stagnant level now india is a country where increase in farmers annual income is jeopardized by increase in inflation in urban areas the increase in the income of a family is far more than that of the inflation however in the rural areas it is not the case and that is the reason why there is a limited real income that is the income after the inflation so the income after the inflation is less in rural areas which ultimately hurt the farmer to a larger extent this calls out for the stagnation of rural income of the farmer so such kind of monetary transfer will definitely help farmer to gain 6000 extra money for its family the second benefit is that that it will relieve burden which is already there under the minimum support price regime in the country now government has been seeing that there is a black marketing as well as a regional disparity which focuses mostly on the northern states like punjab and haryana in western uttar pradesh as far as msp allocation is concerned but as pm kisan provides 6000 to each and every farmer irrespective of the state this is a equity driven scheme for all the next is that it allow farmers to come out of the money lenders exploitation as we have discussed in the initial part of the discussion it improve the credit uptake and boost the rural consumption so as the scheme provides the open choices to the farmer to utilize 6000 for even the personal consumption that personal consumption will definitely boost up the rural economy demand and ultimately will benefit the industrial sector located in the rural areas finally generating more employment the next one is that as this scheme utilizes the digital platform for the identification of the beneficiaries and even the disbursement of the funds to the beneficiaries at three in equal installments it ultimately leads to the elimination of the ghost beneficiaries or those beneficiaries which are not in the real world but are utilizing the money for the corrupt practices apart from that disbursement of the funds directly to the farmers account has also led to the elimination of corruption at multiple stages so bureaucratic corruption red tapism and the ability of the bureaucracy to exploit farmers while disbursing of the fund has been removed this scheme if taken for a longer duration can help india to meet its wto target on agriculture subsidies that is india can stop the trade distorting subsidies as per the world trade organization under the agreement on agriculture in world trade organization there are three forms of subsidy out of which a subsidy given on the input or the input price subsidy should not be more than 10% of the actual price of food grain now it means that let's say the price of food grain of 10 kg of wheat is 100 rupees out of this only 10 rupees should be given as a subsidy by the government but in india's case it is half the price of food grain and that is the reason why countries like european nations and us have been calling to take action against india for providing such a high trade distorting subsidies on the rice and wheat crop so if india moves toward the cash transfer definitely that kind of subsidy issue will be resolved and the last one is as this scheme can replace subsidies in the future what it will do it will bring environmental benefit let me give you a simple example as of now the highest fertilizer subsidy goes towards urea and because of that there is unwanted exploitation of urea and there is excessive application of urea fertilizer 
to the soil and this has led to the soil degradation to a larger extent in those areas where irrigation is practiced so once there is a clear cut transfer of money in the form of subsidies directly to the bank account in cash format that kind of skewed exploitation of fertilizer and the environmental degradation will be avoided now let us start with the limitations attached to this scheme the first one is that inflation is not considered for the money transfer so 6000 rupees in 2019 is not the value of money in 2012 in 2022 as inflation has increased so the value of money has reduced government should have kept the consumer price index of rural india as a consideration for the identification of money transfer to these accounts the second one is the transferred money is not even 10% of what is required by the farmer each year however this 10% is just the basic amount transferred apart from the subsidies there is exploitation in the subsidies there is a distortion of subsidy transfer and there is regional disparity in that matter farmers would be happy across india if they can be provided more than the 10% on these money then comes the less benefit schemes like kalya and raitu bandhu in the states have been more successful and providing more benefits when compared to pm kisan for example under raitu bandhu there is a season wise allocation of funds so before every cropping season a farmer is given the funds which simply proves that farmer is more likely to utilize the fund for the irrigation and the agriculture purposes rather than the personal consumption the second benefit is that raitu bandhu is based on the anticipated input expenditure so whatever money a farmer is receiving is based on the expenditure that person is going to make in the agriculture so these schemes are far better as far as pm kisan is concerned then comes that 40% of india's rural population is landless according to the socio economic caste census of 2011 now as the scheme covers only the farmers who is owning land that means tenants and the share croppers who are working on the field are automatically excluded from this scheme so what is the fault of these people who are working hard on the field and not receiving even a single rupee on that then comes the definition of family under the scheme is flawed it says that a family is comprising of husband wife minor children who own a cultivated land as per the land record of the concerned state now first of all how come we say that a minor children is dependent on land when the same children is working on the land and then comes that why the parents of the husband or parents of the wife or the brothers and others are not included in this family these kind of provisions have been misused where two or three people in the same family have been receiving the funds from the government then comes the land holding is the sole criteria why not the income there are certain families in the rural areas where one member or the other earns a good amount of money from the service sector in the private areas and still receiving the money then comes the issue of the tribal communities in many parts of india tribal communities are not having land rights or individual land rights they have joint holdings they are working and cultivating over a community field so they are automatically excluded because of this family definition then comes the regional differences in the funds allocated so the value of agriculture in states like bihar is very high over there the wage rate is low people are poor so they require more money than the farmers who are in the state of punjab because in punjab because of the green revolution farmers are much richer compared to the other poor states so this kind of fund differentiation should be kept under this scheme and the last one is all states have not updated the digital land records no digital land records means no complete identification of farmers to receive the funds under this scheme now after this entire analysis of pm kisan yojana you will be in a position to answer any question with respect to this scheme asked in the mains examination and with that i am going to leave you with this practice question pm kisan samman nidhi came as a tool to relieve the income security of millions of farmers in india however the scheme suffers from various structural issues so you have to identify these structural issues and you also have to comment that how this has came as a relief to millions of farmers in india 
Try to answer this question in 250 words. With this, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 5th and talks about the initiative to be taken by the state of Kerala where the Kerala government has decided to bring 14 new bills where one of the bill will talk about the replacement of governor as a chancellor in various state universities. Governor in most of the state act as a chancellor to the state universities. However, he or she does not take the direct participation in the day-to-day -day administration of these universities. Now, as governor is appointed by the central government, so those states where the state government or the leading government party is not sharing the same political ideology with that of the central government is seen to be replacing or bringing such kind of provision. As this is just the proposal made by the Kerala, the same was brought by the state of Tamil Nadu in the month of April as well. So we are going to look into the matter from the perspective of these states as well as the other states which are following the same practices or the same practice of removing the power of governor to be the chancellor in the state university. Now, Tamil Nadu Assembly has passed some bills which will restrict or change the power of the governor in order to appoint the vice chancellor. So, let us look into some of the different aspects which were highlighted in the article and understand the issue in macro stage. Now, what is the current issue? Now, the government of Tamil Nadu has decided to shift the appointing power of the governor to the state government. This means that now the appointment of the vice chancellor is concerned, it will be based on the power of the state. Now, why Tamil Nadu government has done this? Well, the government has certain complaints about the functioning of the governor. They say that governor has never consulted the state government, not even the bureaucracy, not even the education minister before appointing the vice chancellor to the state universities. Previously, the same issue was raised by even Maharashtra, West Bengal, Odisha and even the states like Rajasthan. Now, what the bill has to say? The bill has to say that state government will have power to appoint the vice chancellor to the state universities, which means the government universities inside the state which are getting funds from the government. They will select the vice chancellor from the panel which will have three names. These three names will be given by a search in the selection committee. So basically, search in the selection committee will give three names. That three names will form a panel. That panel will be recommended to the state government to appoint one vice chancellor for the specific university. As far as removal is concerned, the bill says the process of the removal will only be conducted by the state government and this will be based on the inquiry which is being conducted by a retired high court judge of the state or a civil servant or a bureaucrat with a rank of chief secretary to the government of the state. That is, if a person is to be taken for the removal process, that person will be subjected to the inquiry conducted by a judge, that is a retired high court judge, or the same inquiry can also be conducted by the rank of a chief secretary to the state government. You must be aware that the chief secretary to the state government is an IS officer of highest rank in the state bureaucracy. Now, what is the current position? As of now, government who also act as a chancellor to the state universities has a power to appoint a person as the vice chancellor from the listed name which are offered to the governor. Most of the state in the country have the similar procedure. While there are certain states which have problem with this. Supreme Court in the past has said that if any state government try to go against the provisions and the regulations set up by the University Grant Commission that is UGC will be subjected to the Q Warranto. Q Warranto is a writ and this writ may be used by the judiciary to ask a person that by what authority that person is enjoying the public office. The second point which was mentioned by the Supreme Court previously says that in case of conflict between the rules subjected to any issue at the federation level, so a law of the center would prevail over the law of the state government. Now, if center creates a law and this law is based on the University Grant Commission Act under which a regulation is created which allow the governor as a chancellor to appoint the vice chancellor. 
So from that perspective, the current initiative taken by the Tamil Nadu would be held null and void. On the other hand, we have instances from the other states as well. For instance, the states like Rajasthan, where the concurrence between the state and the governor together would decide the appointment of the vice chancellor. So it seems more like a win-win situation. Kerala and Odisha has gone against the governor's choice for the vice chancellor appointment. In the Gujarat, the state is deciding on the appointment of vice chancellor and not the governor from the listed candidate. So more or less we have found out that number of states across India have different provisions when it comes to the appointment of vice chancellor to a particular state university. Now what UGC has to say on this? First of all, whatever power UGC has derived comes from the education and education is mentioned in the concurrent list where both state and the central government can create legislation. However, there are certain issues with respect to the entry 66 of the 7th schedule concurrent list. And what does it entry says? The 66th entry says that union has more power with respect to the standards in the higher education institutions. So whenever the point comes with respect to the setting standards in the higher education, it is the power of the union and not the state. So what union government can do? Union government through the UGC Act can direct the Tamil Nadu government to take away the bill which it has passed or it can bring a universal law which is applicable to each and every state through that it will remove the ambiguities and the complexities which are involved as far as appointment of vice chancellor is concerned. The regulation under the UGC Act also says that those institutions which are getting funds from the UGC must only allow the governor to appoint vice chancellor and in this case state government cannot do that. So if Tamil Nadu government wants to bring any kind of bill where government of Tamil Nadu want to appoint the vice chancellor, the best thing which they can do is to appoint vice chancellor only in those universities which are not getting fund from the union government or from the UGC. If the university is funded completely by the state government, they might take a chance to go against the union law. However, as Supreme Court has said, the law of the union will always prevail over the law of the state. Let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 5th and talks about the recent visit made by India's Vice President Jagdeep Dhankar to Doha. Doha is the capital city of Qatar, where the ongoing football World Cup is there. He has paid a visit to Qatar. So, in today's discussion, we are looking into the bilateral relation between India and Qatar along with the overall relevance of West Asia in India's diplomatic reach. In 2022, that is this year's mains examination, there was a direct question asked by UPSC in India's position with respect to the global politics along with Israel, UAE and US, which is I2U2 initiative. Israel and UAE are important component of India's West Asian policy. In the same, we are going to look into deeper dimensions of India Qatar and India West Asia in totality. Before beginning the discussion, let us go through the basic map. Now Qatar is a country which is surrounded by ocean from three sides. And this ocean body is named as Persian Gulf. Qatar is a Middle East country and it shares boundary with only one nation which is Saudi Arabia. Qatar is situated in the northern part of Tropic of Cancer. So as far as latitudinal context is there, it shares the same latitude as that of the state of Rajasthan in India. It is a dry country and does not have large sections of green vegetation. The capital city of Qatar is Doha. As you can see on the screen, this is where Doha is situated. And this is the place where Vice President has made a visit. As far as India-Qatar bilateral relations are concerned. So these are the important five dimensions on which we have framed the content. Let's start with the political one. In 2015 and again in 2016, there were 
the high level meeting and high level meeting here simply means the highest executive representation from these countries so from india in 2016 prime minister narendra modi paid a visit to qatar both the countries have signed different agreements where qatar has started investing in the national investment and infrastructure fund which is going to help the long term infrastructure development in india and both have cooperated in the field of energy as well and to be specific this energy includes liquid fired natural gas on defense front there are two important events the first one is that india has participated in doha international maritime defense exhibition as well as conference also known as dim dex apart from that there is only one defense exercise that is joint naval exercise known by the term zahir al bahr on the economic front there is a bilateral trade between both the countries at 15 billion dollar which is far more compared to the other important countries even the neighboring countries like pakistan and in this 15 billion trade 40% of india's liquefied natural gas supply comes from qatar which simply proves that qatar is the largest exporter of natural gas to india india is qatar's third largest export destination and both countries have signed the startup bridge which is to link the startup sector in both the countries and to your knowledge the startup sector includes the companies of india in the startup sector focusing on the energy requirements of india's future and lastly there are investments made by qatar investment authority in india's infrastructure as well on the cultural front india qatar year of culture has been celebrated in 2019 qatar is celebrating azadi ka amrit mahotsav in its mainland india is utilizing the yog diplomacy along with the international yog day to bring cultural interaction between the people and recently qatar has allowed the practice of complementary medicines including ayurveda in its mainland which is a very good sign and see all these kind of examples can be utilized as a way forward in other countries as well so don't think that you are required to be limited in your answer writing the example the best practices india is doing in one country can be followed as a way forward if the question is asked with respect to other countries and lastly comes the diaspora diaspora in middle east is the most important thing india can ever think of so 7 lakh indians are living in qatar itself they are largely involved in the blue collared workers and recently what we have seen that qatar has abolished the kafala system or the sponsorship system where the worker was exploited and was not allowed to leave the job on their own so they have abolished the system apart from that they have also introduced the minimum wage law for all the sectors this has allowed the indians to earn the similar wages as per the qatari nationals and lastly indian nationals and indian diaspora has worked day and night to contribute towards the fifa world cup preparation including the largest number of civil engineers india has ever exported now from the perspective of the important way forwards what these two countries should do india should allow the qatar to be part of international solar alliance both countries can establish multiple forums and can use to discuss various issues on the international front such as terrorism and climate change india need to make direct investment because economy can guardian the diplomatic issues between these two countries and lastly india must focus on the developmental project and utilize its expertise with respect to the white collar jobs and can construct important infrastructure projects on the lines of chabar project it has already made in the countries such as iran so now let us move towards the broader aspect of the relevance of middle east to india now these are the important areas of cooperation and this is the basic status on meeting the energy demand middle east can help india to a larger extent india is the third largest energy consumer in the world qatar has been supplying the largest lng to india saudi has been supplying oil to india as far as merchandise trade is concerned uae is among the top 3 trading partners of india with even 
the balance of trade surplus towards India. This region holds the largest diaspora that is 1.34 crore people or NRIs living in this area. On the diplomatic front, countries like Saudi Arabia and UAE has begged India's position on the revocation of Article 370 for the Indian constitution. On, in terms of defence partnership, India and Saudi Arabia have been signing the defence agreements and the exchanges on the intelligence on terror front. Delhi has signed security and defence agreements with Saudi Arabia, UAE, Oman and Qatar and have been conducting bilateral and multilateral defence exercises with these countries as well. As far as accessibility is concerned, so Middle East hold the inroads from where India can enter into Central Asia and Eastern Europe for its economic markets and the exploitation of energy resources. So what are the issues? The first issue between India and the Middle East is that India lack direct investment in the energy sector. There is no major firm from Indian side which can invest directly in the energy resources of these countries. West Asia is quickly turning into the highly polarized world itself. So there are countries like UAE which is now becoming pro-West. It has already supported the stance of Israel and this has created a polarized situation in the Middle East that may not go handy to Indian establishment. India's growing deep relation with Israel is not acceptable to most of the Middle East countries. Large scale instability and growing terrorism in the West Asia. We already had the example of ISIS which had become a menace to the international security as well. China is making inroads in the West Asia. It is investing heavily in BRI project. It is spending heavily on the port development as well as the exploitation of energy resources from these countries. And this region has been the hub of money laundering, especially for the terrorist financing. So what should India do? India should adopt the assertive diplomacy on standing by its neighbors and friends. India should deepen its security ties with these countries, especially in terms of sea piracy in the Indian Ocean, disaster management as well as counter-terrorism measures. India should look into the policy of non-interference as far as internal affairs is concerned. And this is something which was seen in as far as UAE is supporting the Israel. And lastly, what India has been following in case of Israel and Palestine, the policy of dehyphenation. So if India is dealing with, let's say, Iran and Saudi Arabia simultaneously, as both these countries do not hold the same kind of diplomatic assertiveness, India can look into the dehyphenation policy, where India should deal them separately without making one as the cause of the other. With this discussion in place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 1st with respect to the Conference of Party 27. Now, Conference of Party to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change has recently decided to frame a new kind of fund which is a loss and damage fund. The recent UN Climate Change Summit has agreed on Sunday to set up a new loss and damage fund to support the poorer countries. Please be aware of this, that this fund is going to support the poorer countries being ravished by the climatic impact. This will include the coastal countries as well as the continental countries. Now, what is loss and damage which this fund is talking about? Loss and damage refers to the cost. It is not the quality loss. It is the cost which is being put from the climate fueled weather extremes and their impacts like rising sea level. So the fund is not targeting about the loss of trees. The fund is not targeting about whether the sea level is rising or not. The fund has already agreed that yes, there are certain events at the international level which are taking place because of this extreme level of climatic impact. And this extreme level of climatic impact is because of the climate change which is human induced. Now, whatever negative repercussion is going to take place on the poorer countries is going to be taken up through a fund and that money will be spent on making these countries more resilient to fight that change. 
it will help the developing countries that are particularly vulnerable to the effect of climate change now previously united nation framework convention on climate change has created three funds green climate fund adaptation fund and green energy fund now today we will provide you a small differentiation between these three funds the first that is green climate fund is there created to limit the impact or the emission of greenhouse gases especially co2 in least developing countries or low developing countries so this is the prime objective adaptation fund was created for climatic adaptation and resilience activities and the green environment fund was created for long term financial returns on investment in green energy which is undertaken by the developed nations now these are the three funds with three different objective and none of them actually talks about the loss of climate change to the poor countries and that is the reason why cop 27 has created this kind of fund cop 15 which took place in copenhagen was the first initiative to create a fund for mitigation action and transparency in which different countries talked about bringing a 100 billion dollar fund by the year of 2020 in paris climate deal that is cop 21 this deadline of bringing 100 billion dollar was later on shifted towards year 2025 so as of now this has been delayed and no wonders that the loss and damage may be delayed in the future as well now what are the merits to this fund the first one is this kind of climate funding will go against what has been the practice previously previously all the countries were focusing on cutting down the carbon dioxide emission that is the global warming gas while the second merit is that there are about 55 nations in the world who are likely to get the most damaged from the climate change and they are going to lose around 525 billion dollars together so based on the same there was a idea and that idea holds merit however the, there are certain issues attached to this fund as well the first one is that there is no agreement yet which has been signed by the member countries they don't have a clear cut definition that what damages and what loss is all about so there is no clear cut definition the second issue is that there is no agreement that who is going to pay and how much they are going to pay for the specific damage previously it was campaigned that only developed countries should pay because they are historically the most dangerous countries in terms of polluting gases then came the initiative from the united states and the european nation who says that there are developing countries like china which is the second largest economy in the world and also one of the largest emitter of greenhouse gases should also pay so this kind of conflict between developed and the developing country is going to shift the responsibility regularly and the shifting of the responsibility will ultimately lead to the deadlock of this fund as well so in the near future it is going to be the time to decide that whether such kind of loss and damage fund is going to be created or not and if it is going to be created who is going to pay the most in this case and the kind of deadlock that we are observing in between the developed and the developing countries also including india it is least likely that this kind of fund is going to be materialized very soon with this discussion please we now come to the end of today's daily news simplify thank you for being participative see you in the next video